Hey, seventh graders, fun little activity for you today on adaptations and natural selection. So this is called the bird beak lab. Your learning target for today, I can explain how adaptive traits and non-adaptive traits can make a population more or less likely to survive. So again, we're gonna be focusing in on bird beaks, obviously, and how that can make an individual bird more or less likely to survive, which kind of will reflect on the population as a whole. All right, so moving on, there's two parts to this lab and then a third part on collecting class data for the second part and graphing that, so we'll move on to that, but let's go ahead and take a look at our objectives. So understand that animals that are better adapted to take advantage of available foods will fare better than those who are less adapted and thus live to pass on their genes to the next generation. So that doesn't mean necessarily that those who are less adapted are going to go extinct. It just means they're gonna have a harder time surviving okay they're gonna have a hard time reproducing but it doesn't mean that they're not gonna be able to survive um, a little bit and reproduce a little bit as well but we'll see that those that are able to really get a good food source every time they eat will be more likely to survive and reproduce okay uh, your materials you guys will see that we have different beak types so there's gonna be four different beak types you will have a clothespin a plastic fork a pair of tweezers and a binder clip. Those are those big paper clips that are black that you squeeze on the end. Uh, different food types that we'll be looking at is, uh, sorry, in this case we got macaroni, rubber bands, toothpicks, and pinto beans. Okay, and then finally cups and a stopwatch. The cups will represent the stomach and obviously the stopwatch is to time each lesson. Okay, so for part one, these are the instructions that the kids in class followed. They will be working in a group of four, and they'll each have a different beak type. So one person will be clothespin, one person will be a fork, one person will be tweezers, and one person will be the binder clip. Each student also needs a cup, which represents the bird's stomach. The cup must remain upright at all times. I told my teacher volunteers today that they could not touch their cup. You must hold the beak in one hand and the stomach in the other. They just set theirs on the table. And you can only place food in your stomach with your beak. You may only grab one piece of food at a time. Cheaters will be eliminated. Okay, number three, a certain type of food will be placed within your feeding area and you will have, I did a minute, uh, to collect as much food as you can. Once the teacher says stop, you need to empty out the stomach, count the contents, and record it in table one. That's on the next slide. And then we're going to repeat the activity with multiple food types. So for the first food type we did was, I believe, pinto beans, and we did macaroni, rubber bands, and then toothpicks. So we had four different levels of that. So for you guys to fill out data in this table, you guys can go ahead and right-click this YouTube video and open that link up, and it will take you guys into this video here where you guys will watch my lovely 7th grade teacher volunteers um, run through this lab. Again, instead of doing 30-second time intervals, we did minute time intervals. So that was a big Doing All class. right, seventh graders. All right, so watch that video, and you guys will collect your data and fill it out in this data table here. And then answer these questions. What did you notice about your feeding abilities? So what were you good at? So you guys can kind of see um, which teachers are good at which things. So obviously you are in a specific, uh, specific beak, so you can just go ahead and pick a teacher to kind of side with. Maybe you pick Mr. Nicholson or uh, Ms. Shockley, and you, and you kind of just look at her data and say, what was she good at, or what was I good at? Okay, so pick one of those teachers or one of those bird beaks to kind of follow and pretend that that was you, and then answer that question based on that. Okay, what would happen if there was a drought and all of the rubber bands died off? What would happen to the bird population? So look back at your collective numbers for each of your bird beaks. Who do you think that would affect the most? Who, who did best with their rubber bands? So. Maybe just check back at that data and see what you guys think might happen. Would there be some that did just fine and kept growing in population? Or do you think some would have a harder time reproducing and surviving? And then finally, what did you notice about your behavior and the behavior of others? So I couldn't have picked a better group of teachers to help you guys out with this. Um, take a look at their behavior when they're doing this activity. It's kind of fun. All right. Part two. You guys are going to have many different food sources. So this is a quick little data collection. Um, again, we had our four different bird beaks, but then we dumped all the food sources into the same pan. Okay, so most habitats have more than one kind of food available. This round, you will have different types of food to choose from. So all of the rubber bands, the pinto beans, the macaroni, and the toothpicks were all poured into the same little pool. 
You're spread out all the materials into the feeding circle. You'll have one minute to feed. Once the teacher says stop, you'll need to empty out your stomach, count the contents, and record the data in table two, which again is on the next sheet, or the next slide. And remember, only one piece of food at a time. Copy your group members' data down as well, and then answer the questions. So you guys will need to collect your data for the fork, tweezers, and paper clip. So this is your guys' data table to fill out. And again, if you right-click right here, open up this video here. This is your guys' video to watch to collect data for the many different food sources for part two. And it looks a little... All right, seventh graders, welcome. Okay, so again, I have to thank my lovely volunteers for taking time out of their day to do this with me. All right, and then answer these questions. What was your strategy for collecting food this round? I kind of go around and ask the different teachers what their strategy was for their different beaks. Was there another beak type that was competing for the same food source as you? If so, who? You guys can kind of watch that, but mainly look at your data to see. Is there anyone else? Maybe you did really well. Whoever, whatever teacher you're pretending to be, whatever beak you have. Um, was there someone else that was also getting the same amount of food, like maybe rubber bands or whatever the case that you had to fight for them almost with to get them or potentially could have competition with. Which beak collected the most food? Which beak collected the least food? We can assume the birds that collected the most food will survive and reproduce, and the birds that collected the least amount of food are less likely to survive and reproduce. It doesn't mean they're going extinct, okay? What will the next generation of birds look like? Okay, so assuming those are the only food sources we have on maybe this segregated island um, as our generations progress, how might that distribution of traits look in those bird beaks? Okay, and then what would happen if all the bird types we've been working with flew to an island where no birds had been before and the only type of food available was toothpicks? Which bird beak type would be the most successful? Which bird beak type would be the least successful? Explain your answer. And then finally, part three is class data. So if you guys are trying to do this assignment prior to us doing this in class, you guys will not be able to complete part three yet. You'll have to wait until um, after the day we've done this in class. So you guys will have some class data to work with. You will also need to include your data into this. So what I did is I made a link to go to the class data. So you guys can go ahead and right click that, open it up. Obviously we haven't done this lab yet in class. So you'll notice that class data is blank. But if you guys have waited until after class to do this or you're doing it while we're doing it in class as well, you guys will see data start to appear on this sheet. Don't forget to add your data in. So you guys have that data from part two. So you guys will need to go back to your part two lab and you guys will need to add these numbers into the numbers in your class data. And so you guys will use this, record it on your slide 10 class data. And then you guys will be graphing this class data. Okay, so you guys will notice that you're going to create a color key first, so you should have four different colors that you need. You guys will use a draw tool for this, obviously, and you guys, again, will choose, I would maybe use the highlighter, would probably be easiest, four different colors and color coordinate over here. So you're going to be building a bar graph to represent the class data, and then finally, you guys will need to label your y-axis here. So you'll need to take a look at your class data, figure out what the highest number um, for the amount of food eaten was, and that will be kind of your peak. So if maybe you go to 32, I would choose 35 to be your highest number, okay? And then go by increments of five. So you guys wanna make it something consistent and not random. So don't do, all right, 32 is my highest number, so 32 is the top. My next highest number was 28, so I'm gonna do another line on my y-axis was 28. You guys just wanna pick, all right, I'm going by increments of five. I'm going by tens, I'm going by twos. Whatever the case is, you guys will need to build your y-axis on this sheet right here. Okay, so use your draw tool to kind of draw a little line and a marker to show. Maybe you guys, like I said, choose to do by five. So here would be like five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. So that might be high enough. Maybe you need to go higher. Maybe you only go as high as 30. So maybe you choose to do by tens and go, all right, 10, 20, 30. That's okay. Okay, you guys can kind of choose how you're doing that. But again, choose a normal increment to do your y-axis y there. And then you guys will go ahead and make a bar graph. So when we choose bar graphs, we choose bar graphs because it doesn't show us necessarily our relationship. Okay, we're not going to say, you know, as time increased, this is what happened to our number of individuals in that population or anything like that, we use a bar graph when the information is not necessarily relatable. 
Okay, so we can't necessarily say that, you know, the more prongs to the fork there is, the more food they were able to catch, okay? Um, so this is why we use a bar graph, is these aren't relatable. We're not going to form any relationships saying, oh, they, as this increases, this decreased, or as this decreased, this decreased as well, okay? So we're just going to have bar graphs to show us our data. So again, if I have the clothespin ate uh, 70 beans, then I would co-draw a bar up to 70 using maybe green if that was my color for beans. My bar, my green bar over here would be up to 70. Maybe pink was my macaroni and they only ate 20. Then my next bar would be a pink bar that shows 20. Rubber bands, toothpicks, so on and so forth. I don't really have an example to do this to you for you guys yet because I don't have any class data. Okay, so again, you guys will need to get that class data on your own to do this chart. And if you guys need any help, please feel free to jump back in the meeting or send me a message and I can help you out. Okay, that is it for your guys' lab today. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, bye.